Contaminants became a public issue in North America when a book called Silent Spring by Rachel Carson was published in 1962. A contaminant is defined as a biological, chemical, or physical substance that becomes harmful for humans or living organisms when introduced to air, water, soil, or food. In the 60s, the use of pesticides such as DDT was at its peak. DDT is an insecticide first used in the 1940s in agriculture and to combat malaria, typhus, and other insect-borne human diseases. Carson wrote in her book that the environment was being poisoned and birds were disappearing. She noted that to find a diet free from DDT, one had to go to the Arctic. Fast forward 20 years later, things changed. In the late 1980s, newspaper headlines warned of high levels of PCBs, which are industrial chemicals in Inuit breast milk. The stories were based on research that measured the accumulation of PCBs in Inuit women in northern Quebec, the region known as Nunavik. Scientists thought data from the Arctic would provide the pristine counterpart to the south. They were very surprised when there were more contaminants in the north. But how did the pristine Arctic end up with these contaminants in the first place? Well, the persistent organic pollutants, uh, known as POPs, made their way into the Arctic through the weather patterns, where they would go up into the atmosphere, deposit, make their way up through the wind patterns and so on, deposit. And when they got to the Arctic, it was too cold for it to go back up into the atmosphere. So these persistent organic pollutants, which are the byproduct of industry and uh, also um, pesticides from very far away, in from faraway countries uh, made their way through these weather patterns and they made their home in the Arctic sink where it was too cold for them to go back in the air and go anywhere further. The chemical was eventually restricted through the efforts of Inuit and other groups, but it was part of the first wave of contaminants in the Arctic that triggered action by Inuit. This first group of contaminants became known as the Dirty Dozen. In 2001, they were restricted in an international treaty called the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, or POPs, for short. First, let's rewind a bit. In 1977, the Inuit Circumpolar Council, or ICC as it's known, was founded by the late Eben Hobson of Utgervik, Alaska, to unite Inuit from across Canada, Greenland, Alaska, and Chukukka in Russia. Today, ICC advocates for around 180,000 Inuit. It is one of the most respected international indigenous organization and a trusted and compelling voice for Inuit on Arctic global issues. ICC became engaged on the issue of contaminants at the international level. It started lobbying against the transmission of contaminants to the Arctic in the 1990s. Here's an example of an ICC declaration that addresses the issue. Let's take a look at the planet and how contaminants get to the Arctic. There are a couple of ways. For example, there are flyers and swimmers. The swimmers are transported to the Arctic via ocean currents. The atmosphere is another way flyers get to the Arctic. This is known as global distillation and also the grasshopper effect. Contaminants from the south evaporate due to the warmer climate into the atmosphere, but they condense out again in the cold. Through repetitive evaporation and precipitation, they bounce up and down through the atmosphere and make their way to the Arctic, where they are deposited and stay due to the cold climate. 
And finally, there are the hitchhikers, which get taken up by migrating animals with their food and may be dropped off in remote places, such as in the excrements of Arctic seabirds at their breeding colonies. Some contaminants make their way into the food chain, and if they are persistent, they may accumulate in the body of humans and animals. Animals that are high in the food chain, such as polar bears, whales, seals, and walrus, can contain higher levels of contaminants. They may accumulate in parts of the body over time. Because they don't break down or disintegrate, eventually they may be ingested by Inuit. However, country foods are still the healthiest food option. Inuit involvement in Arctic research is vital to bring the Inuit voice to important international forums. The NCP is another organization ICC is engaged with. Created in 1994, it works to reduce and eliminate contaminants in harvested foods. The NCP coordinates Canada's action on northern contaminants. An example of a major Arctic research project is an Inuit health survey that took place using an icebreaker in the Nunavik region. It was the Hanuiluk Pita 2017 health survey. Data contained in the survey showed that some perfluorinated compounds, also known as forever chemicals, were up to seven times higher in Nunavik Inuit than other Canadians. In early 2022, researchers at Laval University, Inuit in Nunavik, and ICC worked with Canada to bring this data to a major international contaminants forum. Well, be because these uh, contaminants end up in the Arctic and stay in the Arctic, we want to make sure that they don't enter into the environment first of all. So we have to get to the source of the problem to make sure that these contaminants, that these forever chemicals are not released because they are inevitably going to end up in the Arctic in higher numbers and we're going to end up consuming it. It's going to be in our food chain. So we want to make sure that we have hope that common sense will, will prevail and to make sure that these chemicals are no longer produced and released not just for Inuit's sake, but for humanity's sake, that we are all living in this, in this globe together. The technical body of Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants holds annual meetings to review contaminants that have been nominated for addition to the convention. The Canadian submission of a subgroup of 4,700 forever chemicals at the annual POPs meeting in January 2022 was successful in a first step of the review process. It will hopefully result in a listing for elimination and brings us another tiny step closer to a contaminant-free Arctic. It takes a long time but ICC's work is succeeding in reducing contaminants in the Arctic and in the process helping the global community. Former ICC chair Sheila Watt-Cloutier devoted a chapter in her book, The Right to be Cold, on POPs. We got the world to understand the urgency of the matter in terms of it being a human issue and a human health issue. And we also made them understand who we were up in the Arctic. Eliminating these toxins at their source was really going to be the way that we would stand for any other convention. We didn't want management of these toxins. We wanted total elimination of these toxins. And so we helped to negotiate by really engaging in the, the politics of influence rather than the politics of protest. Over many years and hundreds of hours of meetings in over a dozen countries, the Stockholm Convention banned most of the dirty dozen and reduced the use of three of them. Restricted uses of DDT were kept only to prevent the spread of malaria. More contaminants continue to be added and currently 31 POPs are covered in the Stockholm Convention. It is a long process. 
the Stockholm Convention was a major achievement for Inuit and for the world. Another international forum where ICC is active is the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Well, the Minamata Convention requires all countries that have signed on to it to do annual reports uh, on how they are managing the containment of mercury that they have within their possession to ensure that the levels of mercury as well as uh, mercury itself is not further entering into the ecosystem itself, either through rain or entering through ocean currents or river bodies. So there has to be a process where they uh, monitor and manage these water bodies as well as uh, work with ourselves to take samples of uh, either vegetation or uh, different parts of the ecosystem to see if it's stabilizing, uh, going down hopefully, and not increasing. The Minamata Convention came into force in 2013 to protect human health and the environment from mercury. There are meetings every two years. ICC continues its work to bring the Inuit voice to major international forums where contaminants are discussed. As the climate is warming in the Arctic faster than anywhere on the planet, there are more and different types of contaminants entering the ecosystem. Plastics are a graphic demonstration of how this happens. Plastics take hundreds or thousands of years to break down. They can travel thousands of kilometers on ocean currents, microplastics, through the air, and end up in the Arctic. A piece of plastic dropped onto a city street can go into the sewer, into a river, and travel to the Arctic via ocean currents. By 2025, it is estimated that 80 million metric tons a year of plastic pollution will go into the ocean. The sources of plastic in the ocean come from fishing industry waste, industrial activity, shipping spills, and residential garbage and all kinds of products around the world. Researching seabirds, like the northern fulmer, is a way of monitoring plastics in the Arctic. The birds travel thousands of kilometers. The plastics found inside their stomachs show the type and extent of plastics in the Arctic. Monitoring seabirds has been going on for over 30 years. In Nunatsievut, a community-based monitoring program has been researching plastics in the environment. With the help of my co-workers at the Nunatsiawit Research Center, we have been doing various uh, sampling in everything we get at the freezer. Seal, seal guts, thick bill mirror guts, char guts. We collect snow and all of that is contributing to our data on plastic work. Part of this work has been done through Canada's Northern Contaminants Program, NCP. ICC has joined global calls to start negotiations towards a legally binding global instrument on plastics. I think that's a very proactive move and measure that's being taken. Hopefully uh, all the countries uh, take a a positive approach to that because plastics, microplastics are within the ecosystem, not only uh, in certain parts, but uh, globally, as well as uh, plastic, microplastics are being found in humans now. If we protect the Arctic, we save the planet. And that's what I, my, one of my mantras has been for decades upon decades, for 27 years I've been doing this. And so we've got to see all of these, not just as siloed events of, oh, the pops, the persistent organic pollutants, or the plastics, but everything that's happening in the Arctic or that's happening uh, everywhere else is all interconnected because what happens in the Arctic does not stay in the Arctic. It is impacting everywhere else. So the same with the plastics. We've got to see it as an urgent matter that needs to be negotiated and needs to have that same impact that the POPs treaty did. Inuit continue to rely on harvesting for subsistence. Modern tools may be used, 
But the practice of harvesting food from the land and sea provides a vital connection to culture, language, well-being, and ancient traditions. It is also still the healthiest, most preferred, and accessible diet for Inuit. The discussions Inuit hold at ICC General Assemblies and the resulting declarations will continue to address the issue of contaminants making their way to the Arctic, ensuring that the Inuit voice is being heard internationally.